Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. It's been quite a week, hasn't it? And quite a year. Let me start with macro thoughts. The Fed is now in the same position as Rudy Havenstein a hundred years ago. Print the money or trigger the revolution, said Luke Groman. Ten-year bond yields, this chart is from Raul, who's been consistently bullish that yields, in fact, he thinks he'll go down to zero. 27th of January, in my first article about the coronavirus, I said at the end, markets bought gold and G7 bonds on Friday, that was uh, end of January, as investors dived into safe havens, and I said next week we could see these moves turn parabolic and Raoul's uh, chart confirms the same. The downside is shown here, Nordea asset price performance since coronavirus outbreak, that's from Chiga. Times of crisis, the US dollar reigns. Nearly all currencies have sold off versus the dollar since coronavirus worries emerge, as you can see from that as well. And that took me to escape velocity, how viruses and Northman trade, of course, was quite a wag. It's talking about virus risks and exponential risks. Home Thoughts, this is a heavenly sunrise on Bamburi Beach, wishing you all a blessed day. That photo is by Beata Banar via Kenya Pics, and it's really beautiful. Power does not alter a man's character, it merely reveals it, so said Carlos Fuentes. And then I came across a speech he gave at the award ceremony for the Prince of Asturias Award for Literature in 1994, and it's a tour de force. Let us remember the terrible words that Achilles uttered to his prostrated victim. Come now, my friend, you too have to die. Patroclus, war far greater than you, and yet he's dead. Simon Weil, the great Judeo-Christian philosopher, uses this example to remind us of what Homer already knew. The empire of violence is infinite. It can be as big as nature. Imagine, if you will, this horror of violence so big that it becomes synonymous to nature. Such a violence can only be dispelled by three words of advice. Don't admire power, don't detest the enemy, and don't scorn those who suffer. This is the other side of Pindar's Olympic song. Our age has been deprived of a tragic culture and as a result, it has not known how to respect these words of advice. It's a tour de force. I can't read it all to you. I like this. It was not in vain that Saint Ferdinand, King of Spain, saw himself as a descendant of three cultures, the Hebraic, the Islamic, and the Christian and indebted to these three Mediterranean pillars, he had his tomb inscribed in Seville on all four sides in the four languages of a diverse but shared culture, Latin, Spanish, Arabic, and Hebrew. And really, if you've got time, do read it. It's on Rich Wrap-Ups. It's really extraordinary. This is an age of information explosion and significant implosion. He quotes Mahmoud Darvish, who defines in his poem Reflections on Exile, seal me with your eyes, take me with you wherever you are, take me with you as if I were a toy or a brick, so that our children 
do not forget to return. Balding's World, who's a professor and quite a wit, says, are those medical grade masks in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? The most attentive father in the town, picture captured by Mukherjee, where a garial taking kids across the Chambal River. That's from Parveen Kaswan. Um, Tim, the super tusker who died of old age, thankfully, in the Amboseli, our hearts are broken, said Wildlife Direct. He was one of Africa's very few super tuskers and an incredible elephant whose presence awed and inspired many. Um, this is Lamu, pristine Lamu, photo by Enna Soit, uh, Kenya. It's a beautiful place to visit if you ever get a chance. Rain still continues to fall at Ithumba into February, and as a result, it's beginning to look more like a jungle than the northern area of Savo with creepers and greens so tall that they are beginning to swallow the orphans, Daphne Sheldrake. For the first time, history will unfold in a single time frame, world time. Until now, history moved in local times, local spaces, regions, nations. Now, in a sense, globalization and virtualization are introducing a world time which anticipates a new type of tyranny. If history is rich, it is because it is local, because there were local times which took precedence over something which existed only in astronomy, universal time. But in future, our history will be played out in the universal time of instantaneity. That takes me back to my comment. It certainly feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything, it seemed, was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. Political reflections. Trump is holding up the front pages of newspapers with acquitted headlines during the National Prayer Breakfast. That's from Quick Take. I listened for about 20 minutes to his press conference yesterday. It was unique, remarkable. Speaker Pelosi, I feel very liberated. Trump has shredded the truth in his speech. He's shredding the Constitution in his conduct. I shredded his state of his mind address, she said. She is a formidable adversary uh, to Trump, and uh, he always calls her nervous Nancy, but I think she makes him nervous, and therefore it's that moniker is a linguistic transference of a sort. Ben Shapiro, what are the chances Trump asked President Kenyatta for Obama's birth certificate, he said. <coughs> the US withdrew citizens from Wuhan. It seems like a cargo plane. Just watch this short video, it's about a minute. It's pretty um, extraordinary. Dr. Tedros says he wishes he, has, he had a chance to visit Wuhan. I want to assure the residents of Wuhan that I will go and visit them one day, hopefully very soon. My spirit is actually always with them and with others who are fighting this dreadful virus. Financial Times piecing together the events in Wuhan shows that for at least three weeks, city authorities were informed the coronavirus was spreading, but issued orders to suppress the news. In effect, they engineered a cover-up. Howard French, Mao Zedong, reactionaries are the group that fears the most freedom of speech in the world. Therefore, they use all kinds of mean and shameless methods to blind the people's eyes, block the people's ears, 
block the people's mouths, he said. As I said on the 27th of January in my first article, what is clear is that the CCP suppressed information until we reached a Groucho Marx, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes moment. Now we've learned that the CMP, a quick translation of the notice from the CAC on coronavirus information, Tencent, Sina Weibo and ByteDance are now under special supervision. Tencent may have accidentally leaked the real data on the Wuhan virus deaths. That was a report in Taiwan News and then carried by the Daily Mail. On late Saturday evening, February 1st, Tencent on its webpage titled Epidemic Situation Tracker showed confirmed cases of novel coronavirus standing at 154,023 ten times the official figure at the time. Netizens noticed that each time the screen with the large numbers appears, it shows a comparison with the previous day's data, which demonstrates a reasonable incremental increase, much like comparisons of official numbers. This has led netizens to speculate that Tencent has two sets of data, the real data and the process data. Some are speculating that a coding problem could be causing the real internal data to accidentally appear. Others believe that someone behind the scenes is trying to leak the real numbers. And the chart that Tencent published, uh, I've got a copy of it and I'm publishing it as well. In that report, admittedly from Saturday, they said the total death toll was 24,589. New York Times set up a 24-hour duty system. During these wartime conditions, there must be no deserters. They will be nailed to the pillar of historical shame forever, Ms. Soon said. So as I said, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? I call it the moment of escape velocity, and by suppressing the information for a number of weeks, we reached escape velocity before they properly reacted to it. And now they're chasing a graph that's going straight up in that Gladwellian type description. When we say the data should have more variance or be noisier, we're saying that some days you should get a bag with no red coins, but sometimes it'll be five or six as comparativist but it shouldn't be exactly two out of a hundred at every collection when you're only 10% in. And that, you know, when I say non-linearity and exponential risks, it, you look at this, um, uh, it, look, at, look at the numbers, the 2.1%, 2.1%, 2.1%, 2.1%, two, it's just mathematically impossible. Japan says that of the 273 tested, 61 are positive for the virus, so the hit ratio of 22% is very infectious, but admittedly a cruise ship could be, you know, a, um, a petri dish, as it were. Now, a more frightening report, AI predicts coronavirus could infect 2.5 billion and kill 53 million. Doctors say that's not credible. This is Forbes. An AI-powered simulation run by a technology executive says that coronavirus could infect as many as 2.5 billion people within 45 days and kill as many as 52.9 million of them. Um, I started with day-over-day -day growth, he told me, using publicly available data released by China. I then took that data and dumped it into an AI neural net using a RNN, recurrent neural network model, and ran the simulation 10 million times. In 30 days, the model says 2 million could die. And in just 15 more days, the death toll skyrockets. Remember, escape velocity. 
Um, so have a read of that. Uh, the death rate is falling as we understand that the majority of cases are not severe and once testing is done on larger groups of the population, not just hospitalized patients, we will see that the breadth of illness argues against this being a severe pandemic, is in one opinion. As I said on the 27th of January, the number is massively undercounted, I'm afraid. And the 3rd of February, I was looking into the novel sequence uh, of the virus, um, and this is the dot plot that I found. And as I've said previously, viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Professor Niall Ferguson, he says, in China, maybe only 10% of coronavirus infections are being picked up. And the infections might be as high as 50,000 new infections a day. And the epidemic is doubling in size every five days. As a video of his interview, he thinks 10% of cases are detected. Overseas, 25% of cases are detected. 50,000 new infections a day in China, doubling every five days. Limited evidence of slowing. He thinks Wuhan's peak is one month away, China peak two to three months away, and mild carriers are self-sustaining. Nassim Taleb, an MD, may know a lot of clinical stuff, though not always, but cannot comprehend multiplicative processes. So they should shut the F-U-C-K up when it comes to these risks. In my second article, I was responding to something that Bianco Research had produced, and I said, I think, as you suggested, we need to study the evacuee infection rate and extrapolate from there. The number of confirmed coronavirus cases outside mainland China rose the most since records began, after Japan confirmed a substantial number of cases aboard a cruise ship. Now, from Stat News, best case scenario to de safely develop and test a vaccine is one year. Then it has to be produced. Another video of chemical disinfection in the streets of Wuhan, an epicenter of the coronavirus, that's from Haurut. That took me back to Virilio in his book, City of Panic. He described the city reconstructed through the use of mediatized panic. With every natural disaster, health scare, now comes the inevitable information bomb. Live feeds take over real space and technology connects life to the immediacy of terror, the ultimate expression of speed. Then I came across a tweet from one China watcher. That's why it's truly a mystery why Xi chose to stay at home, not doing some fine acting in front of a camera. This crisis literally affects every Chinese citizen's daily life. It's a perfect time for Xi to put on his people's leader vibe and get rolling. This is the February 17 cover of Time magazine by David Polk. 27th of May, I said, in one fell swoop, President Xi was president for life and on a pedestal. Um, and he's faced with the strongman conundrum, the political brand will not permit a retreat, let alone a surrender. On that point, I thought Ecclesiastes was quite appropriate. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. You can't make these things up. The absolute best performing stock on the MSCI China this year has, been, has Wuhan in its name. Wuhan Guide Infrared and makes products used in surveillance and medical inspection equipment. The stock is up 115%. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 109.68, 
slipping off. Dollar index has moved higher, 98.527. Japanese yen, 109.90. Swiss franc 0.9735. The pound, where apparently Trump and Boris had a very testy phone call, 129.29. The Australian dollar 0 0.76, 0 0.6706, India rupee 71.22, South Korean won 1182.41, the Brazilian real 423.54, Egyptian pound 15.78, and the rand, about which I'm bearish, 14.75. Dollar index making headway, and if this uh, virus gains more virulence, which seems to be predictable and predicted, it will go higher. Euro dollar 109.69. Commodity markets, the Baltic dry cap size index fell further into negative territory yesterday, marking 40 consecutive days of decline. That's from JS Blockland. Gold, 1565.75, and I think, as I said previously, given the uncertainty in this sense of semiotic arousal, gold is a buy. It was a buy when it slipped off that day to 1552. OPEC plus panel proposed a 600,000 barrels per day oil output cut and it should start immediately and continue until June if agreed by all members. I don't think that's going to be sufficient to staunch the rout in the oil markets, although we've got a little bit of a bounce to 51.05. Prime Minister Modi, during his speech in the Parliament, attributed a quote to ex-Jammu and Kashmir CM Omar Abdullah, which was traced back to a six-year-old satirical article from the website Faking News. And I went back to Rana Ayub's article with Dexter Filkin's Blood and Soil in Narendra Modi's India. Amit Shah told a group of election workers that the party's social media networks were an unstoppable force. Do you understand what I'm saying, he said. We are capable of delivering any message we want to the public, whether sweet or sour, true or fake. And there is a whole uh, passage which looks into their use of social media. It's quite been quite extraordinary, frankly. The PM quotes, not just fake news, but from a site called Faking News. This is outrageous, and that too on such a sensitive matter as the arrest of a political leader in Kashmir. Sub-Saharan Africa, preparedness and vulnerability <coughs> of African countries against the 2019 NCOV. This is via uh, Victor Victoria Kolitsa. Um, and says no African country has reported cases yet, which is ex as extraordinary as the suppression was in China in December. Um, global distribution of introduction risk over human population density and distribution of the SPAR capacity index and infectious disease vulnerability index. Um, they've done some analysis, used data on air travel volumes departing from airports in the infected provinces in China and directed to Africa to estimate the risk of introduction per country. Findings, countries at the highest importation risk, Egypt, Algeria, South Africa, have moderate to high capacity to respond to outbreaks. Countries at moderate risk, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Sudan, Angola, Tanzania, Ghana, Kenya, have variable capacity and high vulnerability. Fly Ethiopian, this is an article in the Africa Report by Eric Olanda, gambles brand equity by continuing to fly to China. 59 other carriers from 44 countries have all grounded their flights to China. Ethiopian Airlines insists that it will follow directives from the World Health Organization and until it is deemed safe by the international body, the airline <coughs> will continue its daily flight schedule to and from China. The company's Twitter page is flooded with pleas from African users for the airline to change course. 
this decision is reckless as it puts the entire African continent at risk, said Kelvin Mupungu. Um, continued flights endangers the entire continent since most Africans transit via Ethiopia. I tweeted and Eric picked it up. Do you employ brand and reputation management expertise? This decision is going to be diabolical, it's willful and it's scientifically outrageous. Uh, the nightmare scenario, says Eric, that Ethiopian airlines should be worried about from a brand positioning point of view since the coronavirus is reportedly undetectable at the earliest stage of infection and an outbreak does occur in an African country where the patient zero is deemed to have travelled on an Ethiopian Airlines flight long after the risks were well documented and most other carriers had ceased operations to China. The adverse brand repercussions could be severe. Um, in a segment that aired on Sunday, this is on CGTN, the presenter said the airline's decision to maintain its flight scheduled reaffirmed its support to the Chinese government and its people. Of course, there's no indication that either the Chinese or Ethiopian governments are pressuring the company to keep flying, given the lack of communication from the company, but it's certainly a possibility worth considering. The launching of the African Continental Free Trade Area in July is likely to dominate the African Union Summit on the 9th to the 10th of February in Addis Ababa. Um, and as I said previously, Bali is the epicenter of the China-Africa inter-hyper-connectedness. Next stop, Ethiopia. Focus on the trip, economic opportunities, climate change, global security, gender equality. Stay tuned for updates. Justin Trudeau is headed there as well. And as Taleb said, this is the problem with evidence-based, almost always with great ignorance of emergence and downside symmetry. I said university scholars will study the date, the time, the reasoning, the political leverage deployed, the asymmetric power balance and how in the 21st century mistakes such as these can turn out terminal. Fly Ethiopian. Uhuru President Kenyatta urges Fly Ethiopian to halt flights over the virus. Our worry as a country is not that China cannot manage the disease. Our biggest worry is diseases coming into areas with weaker health systems like ours. Africa Confidential, speaking about Laurentia and Angola. The campaign to recover loot is popular and the IMF is supportive, but the numbers are terrible. The pursuit by investigative journalists and Luanda's prosecutors of Isabel dos Santos offers a temporary distraction from the country's economic meltdown. Much will depend on the investigations into what bankers reckon to be more than a hundred billion dollars of illicit financial flows out of the country between 2002 and 2017. This is a tweet from Jacob Zuma's account. It's pretty extraordinary. Stock values in Johannesburg so low they're tough to resist. South African stocks may have become too cheap for investors to ignore. And old mutual investment group is among money managers seeing an increasing number of attractively valued stocks. Johannesburg market has fallen to its least expensive levels in more than seven years, dragged lower by a faltering local economy, grappling with a long list of challenges. ESCOM, of course, is one of the very big problems. Business confidence, worst start to a year since 1993, underscoring weakness in an economy that's been stuck in a downward cycle for more than 70 months. Global bond market has grown more expensive and as a result of the coronavirus, so it is hard to see a return in that space. However, South African bonds offer exceptional value. Moody's may downgrade South Africa to sub-investment grade rating, which will create a buying opportunity. If I had to guess, I would say that they will downgrade us in 2020, just because we have not done enough in terms of reducing our debt to GDP. But obviously, we have the budget coming, and we have to see if Tito Mbweni uh, manages to pull a rabbit out of the hat. 
Um, so that's interesting, but the P ratio is very low. President Ramaphosa is going to deliver his much anticipated State of the Nation address on the 13th of February, close to the anniversary of the Father of the Nation's release from 27 years in prison. South African all shares up 0.78% year to date. Dollar Rand at 14.75, Egyptian Pound 15.78, EGX 30 up 1.03% year to date. Here you see President Buhari arriving at Eagle Square for the induction ceremony of the Nigerian Air Force three brand new helicopters. Nigerian all shares up 4.84%, Ghana Stock Exchange is down 2.04%. Asked by a reporter if he planned to sign a trade agreement with Kenya, President Trump replied probably before he and the Kenyan president entered the Oval Office. The economist uh, Rachel Dobbs, President Trump has spent much of his time in office erecting barriers to trade. Now his administration is signaling that it wants to tear some down. On February 6, Trump, fresh from his acquittal on impeachment charges, met Uhuru Kenyatta to start negotiations on a free trade agreement, America's first in sub-Saharan Africa. Robert Lighthizer, the United States trade representative, has long sought a partner for such a deal. Ghana and Ivory Coast were reportedly also considered. The hope is that an FTA with Kenya, which exchanged nearly $1.1 billion worth of goods with America in 2019, could serve as a model for future trade agreements in the region. Kenya would no doubt welcome such a deal. America was the country's third biggest partner in 2019, importing $667 million worth of clothing, fruit, nuts and coffee. A GOA, which gives 39 sub-Saharan African countries duty-free access to the American market, is due to expire in 2025. The affected countries are anxious to have something in place when that happens, even though in recent years, despite the AGOA, more sub-Saharan African exports have headed to the EU, China and India than to America. Rather than extend a GOA like his predecessor, Lighthizer has called for a more permanent agreement with that in mind, Kenya, uh, uh, American Kenya have set up a working group in 2018 aimed at, among other things, pursuing talks on a future bilateral trade and investment framework. I was interviewed on the BBC today and I said, look, you know, the geopolitical optics for President Kenyatta of doing this deal with Trump are very attractive. Um, Hippolyte, who's the chief economist at the Afrexian Bank, was obviously unhappy. Um, as uh, the other F uh, African Free Trade Agreement folks are going to be because President Kenyatta is breaking collective cover here. But it's an opportunity for him to get ahead of the curve. He has a good personal chemistry with Trump and Trump's favourite uh, uh, method, modus operandi, is bilateral. Um, Kenyatta said failure to create opportunities for young people creates an unsustainable situation and if this reality does not change quickly, we will produce in Africa many security crises that will leave no corner of this globe untouched. The US and, Canada, uh, and Kenya have added all cargo rights to the air transport pact, that's from Bloomberg, expected to see faster movement of goods, especially flowers. KQ CEO, however, says KQ does not have big enough cargo aircraft to fly directly to the US and therefore benefit from this. Kenyans moved 4.35 trillion shillings through their mobile phones last year, an average of 11.91 billion transacted daily between January and December. That's from Money Academy. Tallo Oil will reduce its headcount in Kenya by about 40% as part of a company-wide restructuring following poor performances at its Africa and Guyana operations. 35 workers will become redundant. The reduced team will focus on achieving a final investment decision for the Kenyan project this year. Tallo's projects have been delayed in Kenya and Uganda where they're seeking to reduce its stake Teller said Feb 5, it expects its total workforce to shrink by a third and offices in Dublin and Cape Town to close as part of the restructuring. Given where the price of oil is right now, I think the Kenyan project, I'm afraid, is dead in the water. Nairobi oil shares up 1.77% year to date.
NSC 20 is down 1.75%. Safaricom was a very strong share yesterday. Thank you for listening. Wishing you a great weekend.